let's start with the, the the beginning. Let's go all the way back. You came from England, and very rarely do people that come from England come over to the United States and uh, coach and president of teams. How did that all happen? Uh, if we go all the way back, I think we're probably going back to 1980. Yeah, so, um, you know, I – uh, during my playing career and then my coaching career, I'd been coming over to the United States and uh, uh, participating in youth so uh, soccer camps during the summer and uh, worked for the North American soccer camps, a guy called Gary Russell. Um, yeah. And one of my stops was always Pittsburgh. And I, I really began to really enjoy uh, Pittsburgh. It was very, very sort of uh, blue collar grassroots. Uh, Not anymore. <laughs> no, a, ve a very, very diverse community and really enjoyed the, the different ethnic groups there that had a big soccer tradition and uh, was welcomed by them and got to know an awful lot of people. Um, you know, the, and, and that led in the end to an interview with uh, Edward J. DeBartolo, who uh, had bought um, a soccer franchise from Jim Mahalke, the Pittsburgh Spirit, uh, back in the MISL days. Um, looking for a general manager, I, I interviewed for that job and, you know, he hired this, uh, you know, I, I was somewhere between 28 and 29 years of age yeah. to become the general manager of the team um, and, and really was given the opportunity to do something that um, I don't think many of us are ever given the opportunity to do. That was learned from an owner who owned the San Francisco 49ers, right. the Pittsburgh Penguins, who had taken over the operation of the Civic Arena in Pittsburgh. Um, and become his general manager of his soccer team. And uh, he gave me a PhD in sports. Uh, he really did. Uh, he allowed me to put a, a business group together as well as a soccer group and really sort of uh, at, at the ripe old age of 28, 29, be able to sort of put all of that together for the first time in my career and obviously made a lot of mistakes. Uh, yeah, but, way, but that has led to where we are today. Yeah, you know... Um I'm not sure there's any one lesson that you've learned, but I do know looking at your background, you seem to be really good at building brands and, and connecting with brands in the markets that you're in. Um, yeah, and I, th I think, um, you know, I, I learned from some incredible people in Pittsburgh. Uh, um, there was a lot of us actually just connecting the dots for, um, for some of your viewers, uh, people like Bernie Mullen um, yeah. you know, with the Pittsburgh Pirates at the time, Bill Sutton, uh, was in that marketplace. Lenny Komorowski, who is the uh, the CEO of uh, the Cleveland Cavaliers today. Vic Gregovitz, yeah. who worked for the Cleveland Indians forever. Uh, John Paul Della Camera, who is still doing broadcasts for the U.S. men's and women's national team. Uh, we were all in Pittsburgh together. And so that was quite an eclectic group. Uh, and being able to learn from people like that, as well as the other franchises in town, uh, allowed us actually in the MISL to understand how to be scrappy. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a football town, the American football right. version. Um, it was a Steeler town. It was a University of Pittsburgh uh, football town. And so for us to find our place in that market and be as successful as we were, um, you know, we, we learned by doing. Yeah. Uh, and it was really incredible the way that uh, the MISL took off and, we achieved some of the records that we did uh, in Pittsburgh. So you were there for five years, and then then you moved to, did, was it Minnesota or Minneapolis that you moved to? Yeah, I came to be part of the Minnesota Strikers um, initially. Uh, Joe Robbie, obviously, another NFL owner. Um, and I, I helped shutter that franchise when there was the amalgamation of the, the merger of the NASL and the MISL. Um, it really didn't work out and um, in the end went to work for the governor of the state of Minnesota for a year and then found my way to uh, the NBA. So the, the governor, you were in Blaine and that was the National Sports Center? National Sports Center. I don't think too many cities had anything like that at the time. Uh, weren't, you, weren't you in charge of like bringing in major events and international events? Yeah, so it all started with uh, when I was the general manager of the Minnesota Strikers. Um, you know, uh, 1994 was um, on the horizon. We'd been granted the World Cup mm -hmm. uh, in 1994, and the governor really wanted to host games uh, in the state of Minnesota. And he decided that he wanted to basically build a, a footprint that would allow the development of a stadium in the end to host games in 1994. And this was all in 88, 89. Right. So I was asked to be part of that uh, group, that committee, and when the strikers folded, 
he asked me to help develop the National Sports Centre in Blaine, which was 58 soccer fields, a small stadium with a capacity of about 6,000 people, but build it in such a way that you could build a 40,000 capacity right. stadium on that site to host the World Cup in 1994. Now, unfortunately, we failed in our bid, so right. that stadium never, ever got built. But that was the premise under which I was hired by Perpich uh, to help develop the National Sports Center. But on the way to building that, then you became involved with the Timberwolves and Lynx, correct? Yeah, so a good buddy of mine, Tim Lywicki, um, <laughs> uh, became... I know Tim very well. Yeah, the SVP of uh, sales and marketing for the Minnesota Timberwolves when they expanded and said, you know what, uh, Right, when we move into uh, the Target Center, we're going to need to staff up. Uh, and it was a reunion of sorts because it was, it was Tim, it was Lenny Komorowski, uh, yeah. it was Chris Wright, and a whole host of other people who you know, um, you know, who basically helped put that franchise together. Well, so you're at the Timberwolves and you're at Lynx, and you're there for a long time. But again, based, there was a time where the Timberwolves then did a renovation. That was only a few years ago. How much control did you have over that renovation? And I'm thinking of that and with the new stadium here. I'd, I'd even go back two, two years further back because we decided to take over the building, which was right opposite Target Center, and we right. turned it into a, a training facility. And that was a very, very complex deal because I had to deal with the developers, uh, Mayo, uh, as our healthcare provider, uh, and get them engaged in terms of coming to the Twin Cities for the first time in their history as a, as a health provider organization. So they're headquartered in Rochester, 75 miles away from Minnesota. And that was a really complex piece of business to put together and then design so that everybody could take advantage of this now beautiful building directly opposite Target Center. That led to the renovation of Target Center, which was much more of a uh, a public-private sort of um, investment. We got the city very, very involved in that. City owns Target Center. Um, you know, they provided uh, over $50 million of the funds. We provided about $100 million uh, plus uh, into the renovation. And we put uh, a group of six people together who basically became the design committee for the renovation of Target Center. Um, renovation is very, very different to new construction. Correct. Um, and um, so I learned a tremendous amount. Um, when you're going behind the walls of a 20-year-old building and, and figuring out what is behind those walls and then seeing what's behind those walls and now realizing how much of your resources have got to be spent in infrastructure rather than fan-facing, mm -hmm. um, uh, that's a very, very difficult task. But in the end, obviously, Target Center, uh, we brought it to the 21st century. Um, and it's now a beautiful building where the, uh, the Timberwolves and the Lynx and many, many concerts and other events are staged. Okay. And then from there, then you went back to your roots uh, with soccer again for Alliance Stadium. How, what's the story behind that? I guess you were approached by – somebody said you were approached at the end of the se one of the seasons, correct? Yeah, so long, long story short, I was with the, the, the Wolves for 26 years. Um, and along the way, I had um, – uh, I'd, I'd been given the opportunity to bring many, many different business opportunities to Glenn Taylor. Um, and I tried to get him involved with soccer on a number of different occasions. And we had always felt in the end that there was too much work to be done on the Wolves and the Lynx and Target Center, um, et cetera. But um, uh, when uh, Dr. McGuire put his group together in the Twin Cities, um, we, we decided that we would like to be part of that. And Glenn asked me to uh, help negotiate that deal for him to become a substantial partner with Bill McGuire. Um, it, it proved out to be, you know, a wonderful opportunity for me in the end, uh, because in terms of uh, now having run the Minnesota uh, Timberwolves and Lynx for so many years um, and then been part of Mayo Clinic Square and the renovation of Target Center, building a stadium, building a brand new brand, uh, the owners in the end asked me to go over there to become its first CEO, uh, which I did two and a half years ago. So um, at that point, uh, the, the design was almost completed uh, for Allianz Field, but we were not a hole in the ground yet. Um, and so I went to work looking at uh, Allianz Field and how you operate it, 
Mm-hmm. And then the different elements of really what you need to put together for it to be ultimately successful um, as a venue for the MLS. And, uh, you know, we were thrilled with the results. Obviously, we were voted by ESPN last year as the number one fan experience in the MLS. So we're very proud of that. And so partly design, partly training, partly uh, our operating philosophy, it all came together very, very well, Bill. Well, tell me about some of the unusual features. It's a sustainable building, I know, and it's got bank, bike racks and things like that. It seems like it's sort of geared to a younger generation. So we sort of put the key stakeholders of every group mm-hmm. uh, inside of our stadium. There were about eight different groups at the center of all of our thinking. Right. Um, and then um, we put task forces together, uh, different focus groups together, brought people in uh, to have them and show them uh, what we were planning, and then fine-tune really what the experience was going to be. And we have, we have some really unique areas inside of Allianz Field. We have a safe standing area that is uh, 37.5 degrees sheer. Uh, it's 2,900 people who are going to stand all game long with no seats. Right. Um, and, you know, there are all sorts of considerations as you do that. One of them was in the world of ADA. They, they have a number of members who um, are ADA, um, and they wanted them right in the middle of the supporter section. <laughs> so, so we built, um, you know, based on that need, uh, we built major vomitories right yeah. inside of our fan supporter section so that our wheelchair-based fans could just move in and be right in the middle of that section. I've never heard of that in any other building. Yeah. Um, you know, our, our scoreboard. So we went through a number of different designs around scoreboards and we started off with four. We went down to two. Um, you know, we had to sharpen our pencil and and eventually some of the cost controls sort of a, uh, had a, a design where there were two boards. In the end, we went to one. Uh, the initial uh, renderings of the stadium actually had the board facing the supporter section. The supporter said, no, we don't want it. We want it behind us mm-hmm. so that you don't influence what we're doing. We want to lead the crowd basically in terms of the experience rather than be uh, directed by you. And so we now have behind our safe standing area, our major board is actually behind um, our supporter section. And so they, they don't even turn around and look at it. And they don't look at what we're doing, but they lead the entire experience for uh, the entire stadium. What's your feeling about when MLS might get back? And I know it's just a guess, but I'm just curious what your thoughts are. Well, I, th- I think, you know, what we're all concerned about is, you know, the safety of our players, uh, right. the safety of our staff, and then the safety of our fans. Um, you know, and in the end, um, I think we will be heavily directed by the individual states uh, that we're in, we're very, very involved with the state of Minnesota. I'm on two task forces, uh, you know, with the state of Minnesota um, around how we return to play and then in the end, how we return to our stadiums. Um, And obviously given what the feds have laid out, which is the uh, three different phase approach, uh, obviously professional sports with fans inside of the stadiums are in phase three. So we're, we're building out a tremendous number of different scenarios and different models uh, that allow us to get back to the times where you've got 20,000 people inside of Allianz Field and create the atmosphere that we had uh, last year. Um, I think it's a big guessing game right now relative to when all of that begins to happen. You know, a lot of, a lot of professional sports leagues in general are looking for some type of uh, tournament setting remote setting away from, uh, you know, the traditional stadiums that we have. We'll see whether or not that plays out. There's massive um, repercussions in terms of national television, local television, the revenues that uh, we all have to operate these franchises on. So the sooner the better for me, uh, <laughs> but, but, but safety is absolutely number one. Do you think that – they might extend the season, or is that getting too late, too cold into the end of the year? Well, yeah. I'm hearing that they might extend some of these seasons, start later. Yeah, I think, I think our league has done an incredible job of scenario planning, and, and obviously the deeper we go into the summer here, um, the, the view of, of everybody in our league office is how do we fit in the entire schedule? 
Mm-hmm. And they're, they're working on a number of different scenarios relative to the entire schedule. On the other hand, as the calendar begins to sort of uh, move through the summer, right. obviously different scenarios are, are going to sort of play out. But I think our league is very willing to push our season out and play a little bit later into December. And yeah. who knows, maybe even into January or February and have neutral site sort of uh, championship games if you could get it all in this year and then roll over into 21. But I think time will tell, Bill, um, in terms of I think that there will be a number of different things that will happen during the summer that will basically be our, our guidepost mm-hmm. as to how we sort of all end up.